hello and welcome to today's webinar where today of course it's all about your deals it's the it's the deals clinic here at nimbus um, and to help me through that i have of course got my my colleague and the um customer success director here andrew green hey andrew how are you getting on yeah very good thank you paul jolly good jolly good um so if those don't know andrew andrew um in a previous life was um land planning director at taylor wimpy for Quite a few years, about ten years or so. So, um, so we're in pretty pretty safe hands in terms of him knowing how to uh, find a piece of land and to to help with that. So, let's jump straight into the um, the session for today. And what I would like to do is to ask the audience um, for particular properties they would like us to um, to talk through. And um, where I like to do that is to go into the little control panel, which is usually at the bottom of your screen, or if you're on a phone, you need to just tap the screen. The little control panel will pop up. There's a raise hand button on there. So if I could ask you to just to click that, if you've got a, a particular property, a particular location you'd like us to, um, to look at, then we'll just unmute you at that point and then we'll, um, we'll gather your questions there. The other thing we can do is if, if you've got a particular location you'd like us to go and search or particular things you want us to go and find, then of course, feel free to pop that into the chat um, or indeed raise your hand and we can, um, we can take you through that too. So if you, if you want to ask us a particular location, the chat function is again, is on the same the same parts so if you click on that and then put in a location and what was what you're looking for then of course we can we can run through that for you so um just going to wait for people to um to either raise their hands or to to run through that i mean failing that andrew we're going to have a little little play on class ma strategies and the new and my new toy so um so we'll see yeah, if very uh very shy bunch i guess today then yeah, the yeah quite the haley's Hayley, oh, she raised the handle. There, she, there we go. I think Hayley um, wants to ask a question. Let's, um, let's invite her up. Um, let's see if we can unmute you, Hayley. Just going to see if we can unmute, unmute you, Hayley. Just asking to unmute. Are you there, Hayley? We can't hear you at the moment. Um, struggling. We're struggling. We can't hear you, Hayley, at the moment. So. Um, like you say, even if people want to just put in, um, ah, she just has to take a call. So, call yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, even if people want to put in um, a particular project or something that you're looking at, or there's something um, you know that's come on the market and you want to sort of have a look at that, and you know we can sort of uh, work through it together and sort of uh, talk through some of the options and things. You know, otherwise then we'll just have to talk about I don't know some projects we've. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah. So Finance just asked that that question. Actually, sort of saying, to look, learn how the tool can help find um, find a few projects. So maybe we just sort of do that. I think Haley is um, on a call at the moment. So perhaps we just jump in and do that, Andrew, just for a minute. So maybe mm -hmm. it's kind of joining. I've sort of seen that we've got a sort of a, uh, a whole a handful of people that arrives sort of after we've explained kind of what's going to happen today. Um, if you'd like to ask a particular question about a particular property, then we need to do is go, go to the control panel on Zoom and just raise your hand. Um, Equally, if you'd like to pop it into the chat, then um, then equally do that. So Lynn has just popped a, a comment into the chat. So she's got a, a property there. So let's just, um, what I usually do with this is um, is, is kind of have the sort of the, the people that are interested in these properties kind of talk us through what their thoughts are with that. But I feel like today I'm feeling confident, Andrew. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling, feeling confident. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to go with it blind. I'm going to see what we can see what we can find out. So. Lynn has given me a, um, an address. So 30, 39, the Shambles, Worcester, is the property that she's, um, that she's talking about. So if we just kind of take that location. So this was what Nimbus has done. Is Nimbus has gone off, in essence, and it's, it's taken that location. So I just copied and pasted that, um, that particular um, address out of the chat and put it into the search. So that search is like a Google-powered search effect. It's gone off, and it's, and it's in where is 39, the Shambles, Worcester. It's plotted that on the map. And that's that little center point there. What it's then done is it's plotted freehold ownership, and that's shown in red, these sort of little red outlines in effect. So you know, so that's showing me title plans, title, um, title boundaries from the land registry all plotted in the map for me in effect. So I can see what stuff's owned. And what I can then do is I start clicking about the map and start to see information about those particular properties. So we kind of know what we're up to now. So my guess is the 39 might be there or perhaps over the road. So that's number 40, maybe the one over the road here is, so that's 40, 41. So it looks like this is the one here. So number 39 is that one. So when I click on a property, the information panel pops out. So what I can see here is we've got um, an A1 use. We've got a, um, a, a shop on the ground floor, in effect. There's the title, it's freehold. I can then see 
um, down here. This is the, the owner's details. It's Ravensbourne Property Holdings Limited is the company that owns this particular property. They're based out of Perlian um, in England, which looks like it's um, Croydon Way. CR8 looks like it's Croydon to me. They've sold a couple of properties in the last 18 months. They bought this um, five years ago, um, back in July 2016. So I guess, um, so I think there's a, um, so that's all available on um, EGI, is it's property link, um, Andrew, that's what just popped into the chat, isn't it? So there's the, the particulars of that property. Before I get to there, I'm just going to kind of see what I can find before Andrew's given me a bit of a, a sort of a, a, a sneaky one across the side there. So we'll hear some answers for you, Paul, but I'm, I'm going to sort of go blind for a bit and just sort of see where we can get to, because that's part of the, the trick of Nimbus really is helping me get to a point where I kind of understand what's going on. So first off, I know where this company is that owns this property. And I'm going to click this little button here just to understand a bit more about these people. So well, this company then is based out of Purley. They're buying and selling of, of own real estate. In fact, they actually changed their name. is Reindeer Court Development Corporation Limited is the, is the name of the company now. They've sort of changed that name. They've got a full set of accounts, which total exemption um, up to the 31st of May 2020. And I can sort of shoot through that list there because what's kind of perhaps interesting is well, how big is this company? So they've got... They've got sort of 4.8 million pounds worth of assets on the balance sheet. So sort of have a feel for this sort of 5 million quid um, asset value, if you like. So they think the, um, the properties are worth kind of one and a half, one and a quarter million pounds in that assets in that, in that business. Kind of interesting, they haven't revalued it. So it probably is worth a bit more than 5 million because they haven't revalued the, not revaluing every year. That's just a, that number's been brought through from the previous year's set of accounts. Um, the people behind this business are um, these people. So Anthony Hawker, um, in fact, he's an accountant, born in 1960, so he's just, just turned 60 years old last year, 61 now. Um, had some previous directors, they've resigned now, so someone based in Geneva um, that has now, has now resigned from that company. So it's, it's really Anthony Hawker, this sort of 60-year-old guy based out of um, Surrey, sort of Purley, um, that's CR8 postcode, so I, my Croydon location was completely wrong, it's actually Purley and Surrey, so uh, apologies for my, my geography in effect. I suppose interesting then. So we've got the, the, the site size, perhaps a bit less relevant when we're we're looking in um, in sort of a, a high street in um, in Worcester, in effect. But there's your there's the property there that um, that we're talking about. I think there's reindeer court there. So maybe they own, they own um, the properties next to it. Actually, maybe kind of interesting to have a look at that in a second. We'll just see if if they own some other properties along the street as well. But my guess is that what we're then sort of looking at is, um, so here we go. So this is kind of, I suspect, why, um, why this is, is perhaps interesting is that my guess is this is probably a shop to uppers kind of scheme, which is why Lynn's interested in it. So, so in essence, what we have is we have here, this is the, the information from the rate assessment. So this is showing me that the ground floor of this property is, is in retail use. And it's saying that sort of the zone A bit of that, so that if we kind of just remind ourselves what the rate assessment is, the rate assessment is, is by definition what district value were thought the rent of that building was back in 2015. So back in 2015, the district value is thinking this is about a 50 quid a foot zone A location. It's, it's reasonably prime. It's a reasonable, reasonable kind of um, location, especially something like Worcester. I think that would be kind of a reasonable pitch in terms of a, um, a uh, sort of a retail pitch, if you like. What's kind of interesting then is, of course, those numbers then with the usual zone A, B and C, then half as you go back through the building. And what's kind of interesting then is that the first, second and third floor, so that the whole building is about 2,400 square feet in total, kind of net internal. And of course, what we've then got is at first floor, we've got this, this area here, which is a sort of three pounds a foot on average, so 244, 245 and, and 489 in terms of those um, average rental levels in effect. And at second floor, we've got kind of two pounds a foot. So it's very much... Um, in the case of, of, of why Lynn's raised this, I suspect it's Shop to is what she's got in mind. And I suspect this will come up on our Shop to strategy on the um, strategy four on the Elite Plus system. We'll have to look at that in a, in a second, in effect. But that's what she's looking at. And I suppose in my head, that looks like a pretty reasonable thing to do is to convert those upper parts into, um, into residential. And sort of with the, with the minimum space standards, we should get you know, certainly a flat, a floor should be no problem at all. Kind of two flats under the old class G, which kind of comes through into the new class G, which now applies um, to the class E planning use. So class G being the, the, the PD right, and I just put two flats above a, a ground floor retail unit. You can do that on High Street too. Question mark over this building. This, we'll have a look at that in a second. Um, in fact, let's just clear that now. So kind of one of the things that's worrying me is, well, actually, it's quite a nice looking building. It's kind of quite a nice sort of area, if you like, it's opposite M&S Food Hall. So the sort of the re-letting of the ground floor shouldn't be 
too much of a challenge, I suspect. The upper parts then, um, under class G, I can put two, two flats above a, a class E property under class G PD rights in effect. So getting a consent for two flats above there should be reasonably simple. Um, one of the things that kind of goes to my head is, is there an issue over listed buildings and this sort of stuff? So class G, you can do in listed buildings. So that's, um, I believe that's right. I think you can do that in a, in a listed building, certainly in conservation areas. Um, it's not listed anyway, so we've not got a problem with that. It's not a flood zone, not in green belt or anything. So kind of we're pretty comfortable with, um, with all of that. The only kind of worry I've got with that particular building is how do you get up there? So how do you get up into the first floor? Um, we're going to start losing a bit of the ground floor space to get up into the upper parts unless we've been lucky and there's some sort of access around the side or something through through here. But it looks to me like there isn't. So it looks to me like you're going to be putting a sort of a staircase in to go upstairs from there. Um, one thing that could be interesting is if there's a, a planning application, perhaps try and see if we can find, unfortunately there isn't. I guess if there's a planning application for um, 39 The Shambles, then of course, what I might have to do is go and see what the layout is of the inside of that building. So where would the staircase go? Could we make, could we be comfortable with that, that that um, is an easy thing to go and put in? Um, <clears throat> it's also we have to get upstairs and we have to go and access that, that space upstairs. So in my head, I, I feel pretty happy that these values here are quite low, which means the upper parts, you know, these are kind of pound of foot, so perhaps you're buying it, you know, pro rata, 15, 20 pounds a foot in sort of capital value terms. <coughs> Excuse me. So I would feel pretty happy that the upper, upper floors are quite, quite cheap. I'd feel pretty happy that under class G, I could probably get a change of use into residential with two flats up there without too much of a problem. My big worry is access. So how do I get into that space? And of course, the access that I'm going to be punching through the front here is going to come out of this zone A space as well. So, so what impact am I going to have on the value of the retail space downstairs by taking the stairway from there upstairs to then carve that, that upper space um, that's upper space off, of course. So that's my slight concern um, over that is, is how do we get up there? Um, there's no separate staircase or separate entrance way down the side to get us into that space upstairs. What I often find is perhaps interesting as well, if I just sort of zoom out for a moment, um, perhaps a few things actually could be interesting. Let's just kind of just have a little play with a few other bits. So first thing is then looking at the sort of average sales price. Here. So this is little average um, residential value kind of overlay in effect. This is showing me across this part of, of Worcester, what are the sales prices? And actually the average sale price across um, this part of Worcester is 212 pounds a foot. So that's kind of good, bad, indifferent, kind of all sorts of, of properties. We've actually got a, a much more detailed residential comps search that you can do. It's going to see well, what are all the flats that are sold around here? What are their rate per square foot they, they sold? It's kind of much more detailed. Really. I just, I just want to get a kind of quick, a quick feel for this. What's kind of interesting is that at 212 pounds a foot, there's not a huge amount of extra value in, in that. So I typically, as a sort of rule of thumb, it's the average sales price, about 20% of that, that's typically going to give me a sort of a good converted sort of sales price for, um, for residential property. So, you know, 250 a foot as a sales price would feel where I'm expecting my kind of due diligence to kind of end up to, maybe sort of a little bit more, a little bit less than that, but you know, it's going to be in that sort of ballpark in effect. So sort of 250 a foot. If I'm then looking at, say, 25% return on cost, I'm going to knock off 50 quid of that for my profit off the back. I've got £200 a foot left over. If I then knock off £100 a foot to convert the building, I've got £100 a foot left. So it would feel like it probably should just about stack up, given that we've got a pound or two a foot of rental level upstairs. So maybe I'm paying 40, 50 quid a foot to buy that space upstairs. So it sort of feels like that should stack up to convert, even with a sort of a Worcester... 250 a foot sales value. We can go and sort of pin that down in more detail um, later in effect. But that sort of feels like it should broadly be stuck up. I don't think Worcester's a particularly exciting place in terms of those sales values. Sort of central Worcester, average sales price is 200 pounds a foot. So you go out sort of northwest of Worcester, it's sort of 250, 265. Worcester as a place. So this is sort of showing you those, those sort of sales prices across the area. It's sort of showing that sort of Worcester isn't um, a particularly a particularly brilliant place, got a nice cathedral and that sort of stuff, but actually it's not a, um, it's sort of a pocket of lower value around sort of in areas where those, those values are higher in effect. So it's not a, a sort of particularly premium place to, um, to be targeting. I guess if we sort of benchmark that against something like Cheltenham or something, um, sort of pockets down here that are sort of much more valuable, I sort of feel like it's not a particularly exciting place um, 
to be investing. We're sort of looking down somewhere like um, you know, so Bath and Bristol, a place like that, where you sort of have this pocket of value where the, the, the values are higher. Whereas with Worcester, we've got the opposite of that. We've got sort of lower values in central Worcester compared with the, the areas around it in Worcestershire, in effect. So, so I sort of feel like um, we haven't got a particularly, it's not particularly exciting in, in the fact that sort of that slightly depressed um, part of Worcester that we're in, we're sort of in that 212 a foot area rather than sort of the 270 a foot area sort of around the outside of Worcester, um, which makes me feel a little bit not particularly excited about the scheme um, in some respects. Um, if we sort of zoom in, the other thing perhaps we could think about is things like um, the sort of class L, other HMOs to think about. So this is the HMO overlay that I've just sort of put on here. I'm going to clear this search for just a second to make this a little bit easier to see. So this is showing me then where the HMOs are across, um, across this area. Actually, there are a few HMOs to central water. So that could be a, a sort of a, a thing to think about in terms of the upper parts. You might more neatly split. You could get two units upstairs and then use class L to go and convert those into HMOs upstairs. So you might get a sort of slightly higher value um, with an HMO use up there. And of course, that would sort of quite naturally, um, naturally fit off the back of that. Um, the thing just perhaps also worth thinking about is I'm sort of a, a big believer in um, when it comes to this sort of stuff that you're usually not the first person to go and do a scheme like this in, in an area. So if, if that sort of thing is a thing in, in Worcester, kind of you know, converting the upper parts into uh, residential, I would kind of expect to see a bit of that going on um, nearby. So um, under the planning button at the top here, this shows me planning applications across um, central Worcester in effect. So these little spots are showing me where the planning applications are. Those are then colored based on what words are seen in those planning applications. So where it's a, a residential application, it's, it's colored red. Um, where it's a commercial application, it's colored blue. And then where it's kind of talking about both, so perhaps a change of use from one to the other, or perhaps a mixed use scheme coming forward. It's got this sort of blue center with a red outline around the outside of it. Then the size of the application is then the sort of the size of the spot then um, in effect relates to the size of the application that's coming forward. So what I'm kind of hoping to see if, if a kind of change of use from sort of storage upstairs or perhaps office space upstairs to residential is the thing that's happening in central Worcester, I'd be expecting to see these little sort of spots here where we've got this kind of this mixed use spot. I'd be expecting to see change of use from something, some, in effect what I'm seeing now here's a change of use from class A1 retail warehouse to one bedroom apartments and two two bed apartments. So it's just kind of quite useful to see that there's a little sort of retail unit up there that's, that's changing of use. And actually that was approved back in 2018. I'm going to look at the details of that, see what that scheme looked like. And equally, there's another one down here on Broad Street, which probably is probably some sort of thing. So we're just the ground floor, commission upper floors to five apartments. Um, so again, there is this change of use of the upper parts in Worcester going to residential, which kind of makes me feel comfortable well, actually this is a this is very much a thing in central Worcester and so therefore getting quite confident that Lynn's opportunity at um at the shambles is actually kind of perhaps interesting the other thing that perhaps I should be just kind of considering is if I get to the point of well I quite like to need a valuation or I want to kind of understand what's the rent on the ground floor then the things I can then use is this sort of commercial availability um which just shows me all the properties that are on the market with the top sort of three or four hundred surveying firms across the across the country in effect so what i can then do is sort of have a little hover over these there was a retail unit to let just down the road there that's on the market johnson fellow so what's kind of interesting with that is that johnson fellows then will know the central worcester marketplace have a little chat and see well how how are they getting on with the the property down there because i'm looking at something just up the road um you know how how are you, how are you sort of getting on with that and, and what are those kind of quoting rates have plenty of interest all that kind of stuff and the person at Johnson Fellows that I'd want to go and speak to is, of course, um, if I think Johnson Fellows don't show you the, the details of the person, do they, which is, um, which is slightly frustrating. So um, I'd have to go and fill this out to go and find out who the right person is to speak to, in effect. But it's taken me straight through to the fact that Johnson Fellows sort of know that, that spot. I don't know what's around here. So Randy Hughes Thompson are also there. They've got a, a retail unit of 3,200 square feet to let as well. So they'd be a good shout as well. Um, there'll be a phone number on there. I can go and get in touch with... Um, with a surveyor at Rowley Hughes Thompson as well, which is an old school website, isn't it? Um, so there's that one there, isn't it? I think so. Um, go and download that PDF. So I can kind of quite quickly get into. Um, so it's Ian Hughes at Rowley Hughes Thompson is the is the, the person to go and get in, get in touch with in effect. So sort of quite quickly I can get into the understanding of who to go and speak to and kind of understand 
um, that little local marketplace. And of course, use that as perhaps comparable to understand well, what's the what does the ground floor look like and what's the what sort of rent level can I expect on the, um, the property up at the shambles in effect. Does that all kind of make sense? Andrew, have I kind of sat around for 20 minutes? Was that kind of covered off that that property? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the the one thing uh, probably to add, which is you know, I just I just put in the chat there, the um, is obviously that property is for sale. Yeah, uh, and it's on the market um, for two hundred fifty thousand. Sure. Thirty nine the shambles, which I think you know, the one thing just to point out, you know, you know, we can look at the um, elite plus, see the shops with uppers, um, yeah. see that. Yeah. You know, the shops with uppers is, um, you know, was was suggesting a property value of somewhere in the order of sort of sixty to seventy thousand based on its existing use value. Obviously, once an agent gets involved, there, you know, they know the you know know the market. They know that you know you could flip that to residential and then start trying to drive um, values accordingly. And sure. they're always trying um, put it at the top end of of what it's worth. But I think two fifty. It just doesn't really stack up. You think there's there's um, there's thirteen hundred square feet available on that on that unit um, in terms of the other parts. Obviously, you would you know you'd retain the retain the bottom, and let's just say that retains the same value. Then you're looking at um, one thousand three hundred square feet. So it's that it's that top one of the two that you've clicked there. Oh yeah, three hundred or four hundred. Um, and therefore, you know, based on on rates and all of that kind of stuff, you'd expect a sort of existing use value to be somewhere around that sort of forty-five pound a square foot. Um, you know, so then it's somewhere around the sixty-two thousand. You're asking two fifty, but if you said, well, okay, well, there's two fifty, but actually the value is in the area. I'm only going to get two hundred pound a square foot um, times your one three eight nine. You're only going to get three hundred thousand. Um, if you sold those units off, you know. So yeah, that, I think you might you might keep a retail on the ground floor though of perhaps thirty grand worth of rent, mightn't you? So you might sort of. Um, I would think at two fifty, that's probably quite a nice shout actually. That because it, it so it depends on what that retail location looks like. You've got sort of thirty five grand worth of rent back in twenty fifteen. This upper space certainly needs to change use, I would think. But you know, if you kept a good chunk of that ground floor space, that's thirty grand worth of rent. That's it's kind of coming in that alone we worth i don't know three fifty four hundred thousand i suspect um that's going to come down i think in terms of you know given that you're going to take a, a chunk of that front zone a and put a staircase in to get up to the upper parts but my feeling is that might that might be quite interesting i'm saying your yeah. friend was that it, it won't suck up is it well I, I i suppose i wasn't really factoring in this sort of you know the investment income i was just more sort mm. of if you're looking to buy that building um, as opposed to the fact that there isn't tenant in there now, I guess if you can obviously find that tenant and get that income on the ground floor, then I suppose that maybe does swing it um, in your favour. But to be honest, just if you were just trying to value it on the residential alone, on the upper parts, then you know you're going to be getting sort of somewhere in the order of two hundred and seventy-five thousand. <clears throat> two flats, two six hundred square feet flats seems about right, you know. So then, you know, what that ends up being about one hundred and forty grand a flat. You know, somewhere around there. You know, you're then you're then talking about you've got to spend two fifty to get it. You know, you you know you're going to have some bill costs. There's nothing in it for profit. So then you would have to rely on getting a tenant on the ground floor to make any sort of profit. Um, and that's where then you know you start thinking, okay, you know, where's my risk factor in this? And then I'd, I'd you know I'd certainly be looking to come down from that two hundred. And I think the fact that it hasn't gone, and I think someone in the chat's just said it's it's going to auction. And then, um, then I won't be surprised that you know, yeah, it will go for for less than the two fifty um, if it's going to auction because clearly no one's decided uh, it's worth it at two fifty either. Putting in some uh, some more detailed um, appraisal on it. So that's the you know that's I, I don't know whether that's what Lynn's looking at doing. I think she has mentioned it's going to auction. So I think yeah, just it's just probably worth mentioning that as well. I think my my take on it would be that the ground floor should let. I would think. I mean, there's some vacant buildings along there. So the question is, what's the current passing rent in, in, in this part of the shambles and kind of understanding what that is. So the quick way of doing that is to, is to put on that, um, that commercial availability um, and then look at what the quoting rents are for the, for the retail space 
Um, and just to get a feel for what those might look like. Um, so just see whether I can get one that's, um, so that one there's on 35 grand. Um, and that kind of go and sort of dig into the details of that on the, on the, on the information panel to see kind of what the quoting rents, kind of what passing zone A rents are relative to what they were back in 2015 in effect. My guess is that you would let that, that unit reasonably comfortably. Um, I don't know the local market in Worcester, so I wouldn't go and um, use that and rely on that as, as sort of to go and buy this building, but I'd have a chat to some of those local agents to see what their, what their reactions are to that. The bit that did sort of worry me slightly is that on, the, on this, you know, two to three doors up, there's a vacant building, vacant property rather, and there's kind of quite a lot of vacancies around um, in Reindeer Court. This is on the shambles itself rather than sort of tucked away in, in Reindeer Court that could be struggling. And there's sort of not really a sort of an anchor tenant in there, but a lot of it is empty, which kind of is slightly worrying. But of course, you're straight opposite M&S and Greg's and Vodafone and this sort of stuff. So it's a, it's a pretty reasonable pitch that you're in. Um, so I kind of think that's not too too bad actually as a um, as an opportunity to be honest. Um, do your due diligence, but I think that sort of looks quite interesting to me um, in terms of an opportunity. It would feel like that ground floor should be worth something sensible. I don't know how you get upstairs. Is the is the kind of the, the sort of the, the one worry I've got? Um, I don't know if it's on here whether there is a sort of separate access through from the sort of the inside. Um, there's an access inside up there that'd be really useful, but there is. If you scroll up there, Paul, there you'll see the um, scroll up a second where you've got the uh, keep going, keep going. Yeah, that photograph there that looks like the the sign of the uh, of the property there. Oh yes, you're right, isn't it? So, yeah. but to be honest, that probably I don't know. Maybe it is still zone A across there, but you know, taking up a bit of that still gives you a good. It has got a lot of um, you know shop front, hasn't it? To be honest, so. It's, it's quite a prominent unit really as well, isn't it? So um, yeah, you'd like to think of all of the units there that are gonna go vacant, the one on a prominent corner opposite m and is, is gonna be the one that, you know, will be vacant last. So uh, yeah, maybe, you know, well, that's, I think that's, you know, more your commercial to resi yeah, yeah. than, than mine. Funny. I'm just thinking pure resi, but yeah, you know, when you factor in a, an income from the ground floor as well. And they are, I mean, the landlord is guaranteeing three years rent on the ground on the building as well. So, you know, to me what happens is if you can't let it in three years, then um, they pay you your rent in effect. That does sound like a pretty desperate landlord. It, it's a quite acute landlord doing that, um, but which kind of then gives you um, some guaranteed income, I suppose. If not rent they're guaranteeing, it'd be interesting to see what they think the rent should be. You'd, you'd expect them to kind of push the rent up um, to, try and, to try and prove the, um, the it's so guaranteeing 25 grand on the rent on the ground floor only it's kind of interesting ground floor only rent could be held in escrow and the money to be available to be drawn down by the purchase over three years subject to the terms to be, to be agreed very interesting interesting okay. well, hopefully that gives a bit of a, a bit of a steer on on that property then and absolutely so let's say Article 4 area. Um, so the Article 4 area for... You don't need to use the HMO in Worcester, yeah. So, well, Article 4, I think it's Article 4 for HMO. Let's just check that. Um, I'd be surprised it's Article 4 for HMO. So let's just try that and see if we can find... Um, there is, there is one in... Article yeah. 4 area to me. Oh, it is Article 4. Yeah, there you go. It is Article 4. Yeah, she's right. Absolutely right. Does surprise me. So Article Four doesn't mean to say you can't get a residential, sorry, an HMO use on it. It just means you have to go through a planning application to get your change of use from C three to C four. So, you, so what we're talking about here. So you've got Class G to get you into C three, two flats above um, a retail or Class E as it now is um, property, which is what you what you could do with that, and then. And then your class L won't apply because Article 4, as, as Lynn said. But what you would then do is go for a planning application where then you look at what the Article 4 says. So the Article 4 would say, you know, subject to a maximum number of HMOs within an area compared with the residential properties must be less than X. And what we're then sort of seeing is that within this area, if I just jump back into the market section here with the HMO data on, I'm going to clear the search a second so we can sort of see it more clearly. Oops, apologies. 
sorry, being stupid, clear search, and then get rid of it, thanks. What we're then seeing is there aren't many HMOs around, so that's what these little, little red spots are. Just get rid of some of this for you so it makes it a bit clearer. Um, there aren't many red spots. So if we're here, then actually that kind of calculation around whether I can get a consent or not, under even with the article four in place, um, wouldn't worry me too much because there aren't many HMOs saying, well, actually it's 20% of HMOs relative to the number of residential properties and therefore um, we're not gonna give you a planning consent on it. I don't quite know why the article four has been put in place in Worcester. It doesn't look like a particularly, you know, there's a few HMOs out here and things, but it's not a kind of crazy, um, crazy numbers of HMOs. So I don't quite know why, you know, if we sort of compare that with a Bristol or something, we sort of see a, a very different sort of picture or kind of, you know, up in Birmingham sort of place around there where there's just kind of lots and lots of HMOs, whereas I don't really sort of see what's to be in quite at that same level, actually. So, um, I mean, you always pre up that, you can always sort of see what, what the council think about that, go and read what the Article 4 says for um, Worcester as an Article 4, and actually it may well be that you can um, may well be get accent on that. I was just a look, to be honest. I mean, weirdly, yeah, it's been introduced in um, 2013-2014, slash and it applies across the whole of Worcester. Um, but they have put in, interesting in their SPV, SPD, they have put in the calculation. So this is the calculation that the Elite Plus strategy does. That okay. basically is, you know, they, they look at the property and then they look at a, a radius around that property and find out how many HMOs are in there. So when you are pursuing a app planning application, they're then going to apply this test to see whether it's um, basically an over-intensification of, of, you know, of the properties in that area. So clearly, I don't know, six, seven years ago, they decided, you know, they were thinking they were becoming a whole... Yeah. So this, is, kind of, this is the um, strategy number seven, the residential to HMO. So this is saying, where do we, given that we know it's this kind of how I found it with Article 4 and how approved in was right, was the fact that, so what this does, this looks at where do I see a C3 house that's a complete house that then we could try and convert to an HMO. And the way it does that is it says, well, Kind of are there HMOs in that area and on that street? And if there are, and there's enough of them, then we kind of feel comfortable that it's a, an HMO area and there's therefore a marketplace for HMOs in that area. What it then does is, well, actually, based on that particular location, how many HMOs are there within a radius of 50 meters of that, of that property? And what's the ratio of those to, to the number of residential properties that are there? Because actually, when we go above 10%, that's typically the usual calculation that, that most councils use and often is part of the Article 4 as well. So it gives us that kind of sense check. And then so what the percent does is well, actually these are all the houses in areas where there's an HMO potential. And then when we kind of look at those individually, what you'll then find is that those then have a, a particular density that's then lowest in this case, 0% actually 50 meters of that, of that property. I guess if we kind of come down here, we'll find that there's a so there's 2% of properties that are that are HMO use within 50 meters of that particular property. In fact, up here it's it's zero. There's nothing within 50, 50, within 50 meters of that. Of that property that's, a, that's an HMO in effect. So therefore, when we go forward with a, a planning application, regardless of whether it's Article Four or not, we then we can then kind of prove that it's not an over, it's not a kind of an over provision of HMOs in there. We're not kind of creating a you know a student ghetto or something like that where it's kind of empty in the summer and crazy during the, the term times with, with you know students coming back from the pub drunk and this sort of stuff. Um, I'm not sure if students still do that or not, but there was a little bit of that happened when, when I was a student. But so, you know, we're not, we're not creating that kind of environment in effect. So, so that's kind of where um, that can be quite useful, actually. And then I suppose the, the interesting thing then was sort of looking at HMOs in this case, which is kind of the C3, the houses, is then well, where can we add kind of more floor space to it? So this is what this kind of colour coding is doing, is that along this street here, you've got these kind of these big extensions at the back. And up here, we haven't got them. And some of the buildings have, but others haven't. So actually... So a, a big believer that when you put a planning application in, if you put that in in line with the character of an area, and so in effect your, your application is bringing the, the character of that area up in line with the, the buildings that you're applying on, you're bringing that in line with everything else that's around it, then typically you'll get support for it. Typically, not always, but typically you'll, you'll get that support because actually it kind of looks and feels right and the kind of density is about right and the mass is about right. And so, so that's kind of then where this becomes interesting because actually a lot of these along here, the, the calculation around the density of HMOs works. They've got these big long back gardens which aren't being used particularly. You've got a, a precedent set sort of further down the road, these much longer sort of extensions at the back. And therefore some of these kind of could be interesting to, to go and try and um, 
to try and buy an extending effect. Um, and again, some sort of thing like up here where you've got these sort of big long extensions at the back that are put on, but this building he hasn't got that. So actually we've kind of put another couple of units on the ground floor and that's going through, excuse me, look at basements and that kind of stuff to, to really drive these values up in effect. Hopefully that's kind of covered. I feel like we've kind of dwelled for quite a long time on, on that particular property now. So should we jump on to the next one, Andrew, if that's okay? We've got a couple of people with their hands up. Should we just see if um should we see if Luke can if you want to get Luke on to tour and see if we can get um uh, Luke Daly. Luke's Luke's Hi. property in the chat actually. So if can... see if he's um see if we can get him to to uh Hi Luke, can you hear us all right? Yeah, how you doing? Fine. Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, I did as you said. I just I did put the uh, the title number in the um, in the chat okay. as well in the little brief description. Cool. So do you want to just run? So I'm going to just bring that title up for you. Do you want to just talk us through this particular property or kind of this particular opportunity while I'm while I'm finding it for you? Um, yeah, I was just looking um, on you know having a look from Right Move not so long ago, and this one did interest me initially because um, straight away I saw the size of the plot as you just pulled up there. Sure. Um, to the side of the, the property, I thought, you know, with the, the option B to somehow set, get planning permission and, you know, build a whole new house on that on that land and separate the land directly down the middle. Um, I had a look at it and it's vast. Um, there is, uh, the agent implied he didn't believe planning would be granted for that. Um, so I just wanted to get, you know, yourselves take on that and what, what your thoughts were. Yeah, sure. So I guess kind of, Couple of things that were going through my mind. So number one, um, so when I clicked on that title, what kind of then came up at the bottom was the fact that there's a kind of plus button next to the, the flooding. So it's it's in a flood zone. It's kind of went straight into the overlays to plot that on. So this is showing you that so the back half of the site is um, in flood zone three in effect, and then sort of bits of it in flood zone two. Um, there's no planning history history specifically for the property here. One of the things I was kind of interested in was, was perhaps trees and stuff. And this feels like it's much more your baby than mine. So I think I might shut up and let you sort of talk about this and I'll kind of, I'll be driven around by you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, I did, yeah, I had a quick look at this just before we we we, uh, we switched across to this one. And um, and yeah, exactly the same thoughts. So the little stream at the back, there's a lot of, if you switch onto the OS map, you'll see there's a lot of these sort of drains running across the land and things, which looks like it's uh, if, you, if you zoom out slightly you'll see across the back of these other properties in this flooding zone if you take off the flooding you'll see um oh, sorry, okay. these all these sort of drains oh, okay, yeah. you know <clears throat> it was sort of like hold on a minute this you know i don't know whether it'll feel quite boggy or something down there so the first thought really and also that the natural envelope of that village or town actually i didn't look at how big the town or village was but the natural envelope of that will probably sit along you know where you can see that color change between on the os map so where all this sort of green is on the os maps this sort of darker green <coughs> that's probably where that line is running in the village so they'll probably feel it sort of you're, you're developing outside of the village envelope once you get into this dark green area however here, yeah this is there's a huge, huge, perfectly sized plot, you know, for a good four bed house, five bed house. Mm. Right that was just, that was the part I had in mind is to literally mm. segregate down the middle and then replicate, you know, what's already there, but on the other side on that plot of land there. And if you put on the planning pole, which is, uh, you're, yep. you're already thinking it, if you go yep. to the left hand side, there's a little grey dot a bit further over uh, on the north side of the road north and then to the left slightly there you go you can see there's a planning application from 2010 where they've subdivided yeah. the plot and added an extra one in. and you can actually see just to the left of that little red arrow where they've where they've added that extra plot in so you can see here that you know they've got right here plot. yeah it looks, it. it looks like it would have been sort of carved off like that um so back in 2010 they were quite happy to add another another house on this road so to be honest on the basis of that it looks relatively straightforward there's, you know there doesn't seem to be any big alarm bells going off as to whether you could get an extra plot next door to that you my know, only fear was kind of trees actually was kind of is there anything in that in that garden there that's um this bit here that sort of i think it's the space here isn't there to put something in i think Possibly, but then you know, if you have a look at the um, the street view, there's not. It looked pretty clear, didn't it? Mm. 
there's nothing in there but you know plus you also want to be looking are there big old hundred year old oak trees or is it just you know 20 year old sort of trees that are sort of you know, the average and and to be honest from what i could see it didn't look like mm. there was anything that i think oh yeah yeah conservation office is going to have a right you know paddy about you know some sort of uh, tree that's going on there the uh, yeah i mean to be honest i think oh, okay. I, I would definitely be having a conversation um try and get a pre-app with the council and just say look this is what i'm looking to do you know what concerns you you know any any issues that you want to sort of that you're going to do the planning and i imagine you know it's just going to be making sure it's designed it's in keeping with the others you know with the rest of the the village it's in the village envelope you know it's just a bit of it's just a bit of you know sensible infill really um so i think yeah absolutely the only thing then i suppose is then if you're looking to buy this property i can see it's on for whatever it is 550 then the next thing for, for me would then be then thinking right well what are house prices in the area um and therefore should the house only be worth 400 grand but actually they've already factored in that the fact that there's an extra there's an extra plot's worth of value here and therefore they've inflated the price of the prop um so that would be my only concern you know am i paying a good price for this plot or am I effectively just paying a premium because i'm buying in a development plot alongside a house. Uh, These are the properties that are sold within 250 metres of that particular location. And then um, this is then in the list form. And um, yeah, two seconds, I'll open my screen. Um, you know, I think... I mean, there's not a lot of evidence, is there, in terms of what those values are, but it... Um, and I sort of not up at that same sort of level of the sort of 575 um how big is it how big is the property on right move yeah it's it was 2841 square feet uh, or something but which would suggest well, that's right in this case you know 300 pound a square foot you know it's just 850,000 so mm. uh, yeah, yeah i mean it's one of those price, you know probably more this sort of level but um yeah the average sale price look like on it um at 175 um 175 is is 500 grand so maybe you know maybe there's a 50 grand premium you know for for that it depends how Average sales price at 244 so i'm not sure that 300 pounds is is kind of too far off actually it may be in pretty bad condition or what kind of fish is in but um yeah it doesn't look great does it to be honest but um yeah, so sort of... i think it was in the family for a long time and the, the uh document passed away yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I think this is an absolute, absolute core, you know, even even at 550, I think it just seems sensible. If anything, I would, uh, whoever it is, Arnold, I feel like they probably could have pushed the price, you know, even more, to be honest. I, I mean, it's a word, isn't it? It's, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of, it's a tired, tired building, but it's, you know, it's a thing. Um, it's interesting, yeah. I suppose, you say, <clears throat> Then would be like a maintenance issue with the gardens and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, if you're just buying it to flip both of the units on once you've sort of divided it, then um, I can't imagine it being an issue. All of these other properties, I imagine, probably have all the long gardens into that area anyway. So it's cracker. I mean, you know, the way the way you would sort of usually find that sort of stuff is you would switch that on like that, and you go along this, you sort of look at the the built stock, and you go, you know, house, 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 house. Gap house house you go well that's an interesting gap isn't it you know same with kind of here it's in effect that's the, the process you go through um, same with this one you know but it's that's very much one of those properties that you'd identify as part of that same with practice up here you know sort of carving that back bit off and it sort of stands out like a sore thumb really so you're just putting that onto there aren't you it's it's sort of nothing nothing particularly tense with that I wouldn't think um, well that's cool it's good, it's good shout. Yeah, no, I mean, like, you know, everything about it, it's on the outside of a bend as well. So another access on the there is not going to cause highways many issues. Um, you know, you're, you're quite close to, I don't know what this little track is at the side, you know, but effectively what you're putting in is a driveway. You know, it's a small little road anyway. I mean, it hasn't even got a curb to drop. So you've got no issues about <laughs> trying to get highways to allow you to drop a curb or something. So, um yeah, thing, just a little check of is um, has a delivery test, isn't it? It's kind of that would also be a 
the delivery test is clearer than them, 33% of the five-year um, land supply, but it's, it's if, they were, if they were kind of in action plan, it would be more interesting. Wouldn't it? <laughs> but, well, but you're talking about one unit anyway, so you know I don't think that's going to have a much of an influence. I think even just from in planning terms, there isn't much to to really refuse it on. Um, you know, unless, like I say, unless there's I don't know some rare mating birds or whatever in in the um, in the trees or something, which you know might might stop it or something, or there's newts or something with you know with it being a lot of water around and all of that kind of stuff, then um, you know it's ecological reasons which. I think to be honest, you know, what's quite interesting, and, and there's a good question from Haley here, if the property's on the market, would you still get an option agreement on it? Um, I think the, uh, yeah, or if you if you put a subject to planning offer on, I think realistically for me, you know, and certainly if, if I owned this one, you know, I think I think ultimately, I think you've, you, you're going to find there's just someone's going to take a view on it, you know, like just buy that, buy it at a sensible price. And ideally, even at 550, that probably seems like it could be worth about 550 anyway, just as the house alone. You know, the vent, you know, the, the agents saying they don't think they'll get planning. They haven't priced in any value for that for getting that planning. So for me, it doesn't really concern me about an option. You could probably buy the house, do it up, put a you know a really nice spec on it, you know, tidy up the driveway and you know the, the garden and all of that kind of stuff, and you might make 50 grand on it anyway, you know. So I think. You know, and even if you don't and you sell it back on, then it was, it, you know, it was worth a try. Um, you know, so for me, it's not like it's, it's not like they say, oh, it's 800 grand because we think you can get another plot on there. It's the price to on basically what it is. There's no, there's no hope value in there at all. So I personally, I mean, I appreciate this is, I've, I've had a 10 minute view on it, but if I was genuinely seriously and looking into this and I'd spent a bit more time on it, I don't think I'd be on the face of it. I don't think I'd be worried about a subject to or anything like that. I would just say, yeah, you know, assuming the numbers stack up and everything, I'll give you 550 for it and, you know, take it off the market now, please. And let me get in front of the planner um, and have a chat with them and just, you know, start, start designing up something to fit in that spot. I think it's a great, so, great one, Luke. Yeah, no, cheers. Thanks. Thanks for that, guys. Really helpful. And if that works, then what you want to do is is write a letter to uh, you know the one opposite, and then yeah, the other. this one here, yeah. yeah, that one there maybe. Let me this one there, this one, yeah, um, this one, and then you'll become the you know you'll have to be, call yourself you know Newton Flotman Builders Limited or something by that point because you um, you know redeveloped out the whole village, but. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, that is arguably, you know, that's, you know, we've got the Elite Plus strategy number six, and that is primarily the kind of plots that it's looking for. It's looking for large, underdeveloped plots um, across these villages. And there will be, and that's a prime example, there'll be lots of these things that's been in our family forever. And now all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the kids of the family who have, you know, passed away or whatever, They've probably got their, you know, London pads and all of that kind of stuff, and are just thinking, you know, what the last thing we want is that um, that property from mum and dad, and and um, and just sell it on, which is, you know, it's a great opportunity. The mine unit scheme, um, Andrew, that was granted in two thousand and thirteen, um, just up the road from there. So mm. there's a um, this scheme here was a a new knock down of a house and put nine units on it. Sort of, it's right tucked up there, but it it got consent back then. So, again, some kind of it's a little bit old. It's kind of quite a while ago, but it sort of does make you feel sort of confident, doesn't it? Really? Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, I don't know Norfolk at all. Like you say, you need to build up an understanding with the with the planners to get a to get a feel for um, you know for what they're like, and you know having conversations with them will will, will accelerate that. Um, but uh, yeah, for me, I just think. It's, it's just nothing really contentious about it. I think if you were really going in and trying to put nine plots on there and really stretch into that garden, then then I think then you would then you would absolutely be subject to, like I wouldn't be buying it on the basis of the value that that would generate. But um, for an extra plot and at that price, I think it's a, it's a no brainer, especially because the property is in not great, great shape. So you could just, you could just do a flip on the property. Not that it would make huge amounts of money, but um, you know, with putting it out in a decent spec, you'd like you to make a slight turn on that, you know, on the on the cost of putting in a decent spec, you know. So even if it was just 
cost you 20 grand to update the building, but you know, you sold it for another 25 grand, then you know, it's no harm done. It was worth a try. This is, um, well, is something. Sorry, Tibali. So I was going to say, it, just on that, is did you say, you know, getting a rough idea from, you know, local authorities or planners, um, having a word with them before I even, you know, went ahead with it all just to get a vague idea if it's something they would or wouldn't be approved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You can have um, pre-app discussions with the, with, the, with the planning officers. So, you know, if you, if you um, I don't know where it is on, uh, I think it was Norfolk or something, but, you know, Norfolk planning website, there'll be a spot about um, being able to contact um pre-app discussions some councils charge a hundred pound for it but it's a it's basically it's informal advice so that it, you know they're not giving you planning advice per se but that you're you know you're essentially going if we were to put a, a planning application in here like this what concerns would you have and then normally through that exercise they'll say it looks like you know it's in a flood zone and it's here and all oh, the highways looks like it might be an issue and actually i'm concerned the driver might be too long you know they'll just raise some issues and you'll know from that discussion actually oh god i never thought about the flooding or something I'll, I'll i'll pick that up or if they say look on the face of it, it looks okay but we'll need to see the specific plans and we'll need to you know appraise it through a normal planning process then then fine but if they're not highlighting anything any significant concerns at that stage then, then I'd be putting a planning application in and then just working with them to, to get it right. And I think at that stage, it just comes down to <coughs> have you used the right bricks? You know, is it in keeping? Should you have stepped back another couple of meters or that kind of stuff? So a little play here. This is the, the planning export for um, for South North. In fact. So what I did with this is go into the, into the planning exports um, here and did the residential opportunities exports. So this kind of looking for residential planning applications that have been submitted across South Norfolk um, and removing kind of clutter out of the out of the export in effect. So what you get is you get a list of these are the recent planning applications across South Norfolk. And what I was kind of interested in is is kind of well who is that who is that architect that might be able to help or where's my sort of list of three or four that I'm kind of interested in. Um, so these are all then residential planning applications. You kind of go through and have a look at which ones you're kind of really interested in. But um, you know knocking down of a shed to put two residential properties on it. So this is East Carlton, wherever that is, recently got a planning ticket on which kind of thought it'd show any approvals. And on the right hand side, then we can see that WT Design Limited got that planning consent. It's David Gratton there that did it. So just kind of a quick way to, to get a feel for who are those who are those people that are active and kind of getting a getting planning tickets in that area. And Andrew, you kind of often do um, do this, don't you sort of order it A to Z to say, well, kind of who are these sort of companies that sort of appear on this quite regularly in you know, cornerstone planning and Gary John's architect and, and this sort of stuff. So you could sort of see who are those active companies that are sort of covering South Norfolk um, and who are the people there that need to go get in touch to have a chat to about it in effect. So um, that could also be quite useful if you sort of have a little look through that, that file and see you know, 16 units there approved with conditions. And I suppose what I also quite like with this is perhaps um, within all of this, if you, if you filter this for the stuff that's being approved recently then what you find is you've got a sorry been bought recently you've got kind of people that are buying sites and they're submitting residential planning applications on them they're typically then your local um your local developers and so kind of you know groundhog property services limited maybe they're kind of interesting or traditional english properties limited they're sort of little local developers that are covering this part of um of of norfolk in effect and a cgg land and property limited and, and kind of what's interesting then is that these people then are use it sort of trusting Peter Codling architects to go and do their work for them. So actually kind of that, that sort of list of local architects, the local developers like is, is that one there. So perhaps they're perhaps should be on your list of people to speak to about, um, about whether they whether they can help you with that particular site, with do you get consent on it or not. And perhaps they kind of a quiet word with the planners while they speak to them on something else they're dealing with. Perhaps they can have a quiet word on this particular site and just see what, um, what reaction they get. Um, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'll just I'll just put the link in there, which is the to the Norwich planning portal for their for their little pre app advice section and um, and yeah, you know, advice on the need for planning commission or planning history, change of use, um, basic management schemes, proposing one to nine dwellings. It's three hundred and sixty pounds um, they're charging to have that meeting. So 
clearly, yeah, prices have, uh, have gone up a little bit uh, since, or maybe Norwich is charging a lot more than uh, than the the councils that I'm used to speaking to. But you can see there that you know, three hundred and sixty pounds, you can get in front of a um, a planner, and they'll give you a view of, of whether the well, what does it say? It says the when they can give you advice on the likelihood of your application being successful, the processes involved, what information you need for your application. Um, and the policies your proposal will be assessed against. Um, you know, so ultimately for £360, you can speak directly to the planning authority and find out, you know, if you get a quick scheme drawn up, so like you say, speak to an architect, get a scheme and, and just even just a square and say, look, we're thinking a four bed house here, sit in front of a planner and, and then they'll um, they'll give you a quick assessment on, on whether they think there's, whether it's going to have, you know, a chance or not. And if not, then these are the policies it's assessing against and where they think there's issues already, you know. Yes. Thank you, Luke. I hope that's been helpful. Sure. Yeah, brilliant. Cheers, guys. Fabulous. Um, I'm sort of conscious of time. Um, Garrick's put a question in the chat about um, we'll be able to use Nimbus to find a viable commercial um, conversion or HMO, shop floppers, um, without a specific address. So, say, in Bristol or Bath. Um, so I sort of feel like we can do that very quickly, Andrew, just using Elite Plus, kind of the easiest thing to do, isn't it? It's kind of just whistle into, into there and just kind of quickly show you that. So. We sort of touched on bits of that um, with the previous bit of the demonstration, but in essence, if I was looking in Bristol, say for shop to uppers, I would use the strategy overlay, kind of the easiest, easy way to do this, kind of quickest way to show that in the sort of three or four minutes we've got left in effect. So also for shop to uppers, strategy four would give me that class G shop to uppers um, use, what that's doing is saying, where do I see commercial uses above a retail unit? And then it's comparing the residential values in the area with the existing use value for that building, and the sensible conversion costs and saying, is there 25% return on cost on that upper space or not? So, so that would be a really sort of simple way to do that. Um, for each of those, then you sort of, you know, you zoom in and they've got the kind of the, the predicted profit levels that sit on top of those. So for example, here's a, a particular property. It's got 800 square feet above um, ground floor. It's got a very low rate assessment. So it's sort of saying you can buy and convert 120 quid it's worth 350 on average. So that's kind of 450,000 pounds worth of um, worth of value that can be had off that. So very simple then to do the next step, which is to then click on the title, add that site to your workflow, um, click save. And then in your workflow, what then happens is then you can very quickly, you can just download the, the sort of full list of work, which then gives you a very quick way to send out an awful lot of letters. If, if the property and company ownership, it sort of puts the owner's details into that Excel file for you to mail merge um, your letters out. If it's in private ownership, you can buy the title registers through Nimbus at three pounds a go on your elite, in elite subscription. That will then, in effect, pull the details off that register for you and give you that in that nice neat format as well. So when I click that download button, I have a nice neat list of all these properties, all the owner's details in it, all kind of laid out in a nice neat way. I can then go and send my letters out to go and contact those owners in effect. So I'd use the, the strategy four to find those shop with uppers. If I was looking for commercial conversions, I would probably struggle to beat the class MA, the new strategy number nine. Strategy number nine, in effect, is looking for all class E properties. It's looking for where those buildings then have a residential feel to them. So it's looking to say, are there residential properties around that, around that particular location? Is there a kind of sensible density of that? So it kind of feels like a, a place where converting to residential would work. It removes things like listed buildings and stuff in flood zones and this kind of stuff so that we're not going to get sort of caught out by some of the planning policies that would stop me being able to use class MA um, as part of that. And then it sort of then applies sort of calculation of more detail in effect. So for example, here, the day nursery, which is the new class E um, planning use in effect. It's 5,000 square feet. The calculation here is a little little kind of um, appraisal here saying that the sales values in this part of, um, of Bristol about 400 pounds a foot, assuming hundred pound a foot conversion cost and a purchase price based off 10 pound 50 rent, 7% of the year is 140 pounds a foot. That gives us a 6, 7% return on cost, um, which is 780,000 pounds in effect. So kind of very quick ways of picking out those buildings, again, saving those to your workflow, sending your letters out um, to unlock all of that. So I think that's probably the way I would find my commercial conversions. We've got a, um, another strategy in here, which is the sort of low value commercial buildings in residential areas. What this does is a similar thing to the class MA, but it's just sort of looking in sort of slightly simpler terms at kind of a broader list of uses um, and without kind of the, the intricacies of the, 
um, of the of the class MA in effect. So this can give us a sort of slightly different list of, of properties in effect, and then we can convert those to, to residential too. So you can sort of see a slight difference between that one and the um, and the class MA PD rights. Um, I suspect that's probably there's some, some flooding issues around here actually, because the class MA is kind of you can still get away with the flooding stuff and, and the upper class stuff. So it's a slight difference in those two um, those two strategies. The, the low value commercial buildings, anything in a flood zone is removed from the um, from the map in effect. So so that's kind of what those do. So those are my kind of my quick ways of doing it. And then the, the HMOs, as I said, were sort of showed you before with the strategy number seven in effect. It's kind of showing you, regardless of Article Four, this is saying is there the right density of HMOs relative to relative to residential properties in an area, and then which of those properties then that that kind of match that, and of course then colour coded based on the ones that got more potential than others in effect. So it's picking out those HMO areas in a particular town. So you know you've got a marketplace to go into. Then checking that policy terms it should um, have the right kind of density for it to, to pass the, um, the local the local test in effect not always but kind of giving sort of a, sort of a sensible a sensible um, approach to that and then saying well, where's that scope to extend on the ground floor to put more space in go to the roof that sort of stuff is kind of shown off the back of that so so those kind of four or five ways would be the sort of the quickest ways to go and find those and use the workflow to go and um, drive some some big letter campaigns off the back of that. Um, there is, I believe, Andrew, a... Um, and to that, Paul, just as the, I think, just to answer another question, very similar to that is, I think, um, Rowett, would you recommend focusing on on-market or direct to vendor? I think, obviously, the, 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 the strategy we've just shown you there are, are primarily to, to focus on off-market. It's not to say the odd one might be on the market. You can check that, obviously, with the, um, with the overlays. But I think, for me, it's, if it's off-market, you potentially get you know you potentially in a conversation with a vendor, anyone who does come back to you that doesn't know about this additional value, and so then you're, you're talking about a value which, like the property we talked about with Luke, you know that, that they're not realising that potentially there's a, there's another hundred grams worth of value in there because they you could actually get another plot, and that's the same kind of thing with a with a shop. It might be that they're willing to accept a lower value because they think well it's only worth what the shop is, not the potential extra value of the the residential. I think whereas you're on market, you've got an agent, theoretically, that agent is then a bit more up to speed and is then appraising that property on the basis of, well, actually, you could do this upstairs, you could do this, you could do that. And then we'll be then trying to command a much higher price and you're competing with everyone else. So I think... Yeah, I mean, you've sort of, you've seen that come through in today's webinar, basically. So you know, the, the, the comment with, with Luke, you know, I found this site, it's on right move. Um, are you going to get an option on that? Well, the answer to that is probably it's going to be quite hard. Um, if Luke had written to that owner three months ago before it was going on the market, then if he'd said, well, actually, yeah, how about I go get a plane ticket on it and I pay this much extra and just took the land off the side of it, you keep the house, you could use that money to go and refurbish the house and then sell it and make more money on it, then that'd be a very different conversation from where it is now, where the owners just want to get rid of this thing. And so if Luke comes and says, well, I want to go and do a subject two deal with you and I'll give it more on, on, the, on the upside, it's like, well... And the agent sat there going, well, I want to get my fee in. So um, I've got an unconditional offer over here, or I've got Luke that wants to do a conditional one, and it's going to take another six months, 12 months, could be 18 months as far as we know. You might give pay an extra 20 grand, but you know, there's, there's this kind of harder, harder sales pitch. Whereas, of course, if you're off market, truly off market, where you've written to the owner and, and the owner's kind of thinking, well, I might sell, but I'm not, I've got nobody there I can just go and sell it to now and get my, get money out of my current account in you know, six weeks' time or whatever then that discussion is so much easier because then you can share that upside. They'll kind of, you can sort of get them in the mindset of coming on the journey with you. You can get them to understand that, that you're the best person to go and get that consent because all the due you've done on the back behind it all. And therefore, for me, um, I mean, there's kind of, there's always sort of two kinds of off-market. There's the off-market you go and get yourself like that. There's the off-market with an agent involved, which I always think is kind of, isn't really kind of off-market. It's kind of a blend of on-market and sort of a bit in the middle, really. Because again, the, 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 the professionals in that in that in scenario want to try and get these deals over the line and get the fees in and, and get them moving forward and get kind of get it all de-risked and unconditional rather than whereas of course what you want to do is as a developer or an investor you want to sort of share that risk with the owner so you're not kind of getting caught in the in the wrong position in effect so so for me it's a out and out off market direct to vendor is a much better way of doing that you have more time to get yourself organized you have a um sort of a much easier route through it than so if you're on market, we are sort of trying to, someone's got their heart set on selling this building, it's just a question of what price is going to be for. 
Um, and you're sort of saying, well, actually, have you thought about not selling it that way and actually kind of waiting 12 months for your, for your money? And it's like it's quite a big sell at that point. So for me, it's, um, it's off, off market rather than um, off market through agents or on market through agents. I kind of find that is it an easier route through. Yeah. There's more, more money to be made off market. You know, if, if I look at my old um, Olympi days, you know, we make, oh, we, as in if I was still there, the, you know, make more on off market deals that we do than we do on, on market ones. You know, the on market ones help fill the gap. You know, the, the big, big developers, they do their big off market deals, which might be, you know, on a, on a piece of agricultural field which might take 10 years to get planning on, but then they're, they're, in, they're buying it at an inherent discount, which is then going to feed through a much stronger um, profit margin than just those ones that they're just buying, you know, that have already got planning permission, but they then help fill the gaps for when you know, there's delays through planning and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, if, if you're not on your own, you'll make more money trying to find those off-market ones than you will only focusing on on-market. Sure. So quick recap. So class I made that I've used today, um, covers this this is kind of where class ma fits in so it's class e properties up to 1500 square meters worth of size kind of quite a big 15,000 square feet just over have a residential feel to those locations but then excluding those article two three um areas so a or b um, spa rules national parks all that kind of stuff just management listed buildings again it doesn't apply to those so those will be removed out of the um out of the platform i showed you shop stoppers so that's the the class gpd rights where you're looking at converting the upper parts into two flats. And of course, then you can put your, your class L on top of that subject to article four, as, um, as Lynn said earlier. That's the, the shops up strategy we have here at Nimble Strategy number four. We looked at the low value commercial um, in residential areas, which was strategy five. Um, that really is looking at kind of where do we see those low value commercial buildings we can, can, can go and convert to, um, to residential, kind of a bunch of policies that's behind it. But in essence, it's this sort of stuff where you've got kind of quick fits, dare I say it, where you've got kind of small um, commercial buildings at low value in areas where the values are much higher and it's got that residential feel to that location and removes, removes stuff like green belt and flood zones two and three because getting new consents in those locations can be very difficult, getting new dwellings in those locations can be difficult. So it's all kind of removed out of those, out of those strategies. And then of course then um, the class ZAP, right, so we didn't look at, which is where you can knock down existing class E, kind of B1, B2, so the old B1 uses, so um, offices, sheds, light industrial sheds and um, R&D buildings and, and rebuilding those flats with two stories on top in effect. That was strategy one I didn't show you today in effect, but um, that's perhaps one we should have had a look at today. If anybody was interested in that, we can cover that in a separate webinar in effect. These are the, the ways in which we find this and it's kind of how we've sort of managed to identify those opportunities on the Elite Plus system. And it's interesting that we have, um, the, you have a, the Elite system, which is £440 for the year. That gives you 12 months access to the Elite platform, one-to-one -one support from our customer success team, weekly webinars with myself and um, another guest, and then a three-part training series with, um, with myself as well. We take you through the top to, top to bottom of the platform. Um, some training sessions coming up shortly. And of course, what we have at the moment is a, a commercial conversions bundle that's um, currently running at 50% off at the moment. So where it would be two and a half thousand pounds, or just under two and a half thousand pounds for the for the year, you can actually access that half price, which is twelve hundred pounds for the year, if you're interested in that. So that includes strategy one, four, five, and nine. So that's the class Z A, class G, class M A, um, and the low value commercial buildings in, in residential areas. If anybody's interested in that, we can pop a link into the chat. Um, you can have a fourteen day free trial of the system, um, and indeed a one to one call um, with our team here at Nimbus that will. Um, will help you with um, any issues you've got and kind of take you through the, how the, the system works in effect. Um, I do have a link that I can pop into the chat for you to arrange a call with the team. Um, I do just need to go and get that for you though. So that will just take me a moment to copy and paste unless you've got that, Andrew, to hand. I don't, unfortunately, Paul. Okay, two seconds. Let me just pop on chat. If anyone wants, um, wants to do, to jump on with that, give me one second. Um, send that to everybody. So there's the bit.ly link. If you want to arrange a, um, a, a call with one of the team here to book in your, um, your free trial or indeed your, your one to one demonstration of the platform, then that link there, um, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash bit.ly forward slash three I H capital Y I T E. Very, very catchy bit.ly link there we've, uh, we've created for you all. So, um, so I'm sure you won't forget that, but it's in the chat now if anybody wants that. Um, 
and off we go. So, so I think that has us kind of sort of final questions, Andrew, that we just kind of pick up yeah. on. I think there was, I mean, someone else raised, I think, a property, um, Finn, about a property in, in Crouch End, but obviously we've, we've run out of time. But um, do feel free to book a call. Finn and, and, um, and the team can obviously, you know, talk, talk through that particular um, property or talk you through some of the, the ways we can assess and see whether it's uh, whether it's a decent scheme or not. And likewise, I think Gilbert as well, same thing, you know, looking at a scheme in, um, in two in Broadway. So... Um, yeah, you know, we, to book a call, we can talk through it at another time as well, because fortunately we've run out of time. I think all that remains to me is firstly, um, thank you, Andrew, for your help today. Much appreciated. Yeah, no, thank you. Fabulous. And then thank you all for, for watching today. Um, think of fun. Hopefully it's been useful. Hopefully it's um, helped you understand how we can use Nimbus and how we can um, kind of help with the, uh, with the, the journeys you're all on. Um, I've been Paul Davis. We've been Nimbus Maps. We'll look forward to you again soon. All the best. Bye for now.